We're happy to be here another time in the house of the Lord where we are studying in our text. Today we are in Exodus chapter, um, we are going to go to chapter 31 in our study of the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 31. Praise the Lord. Exodus chapter 31. Uh, let us bow our heads in prayer as we commence our time of studying. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for this privilege that we can be in your house on the Lord's day in your sanctuary. We are grateful to you for the spirit of our lives. And God, you said, let everything that have bread praise the Lord. And Lord, even though our circumstances and our situation may not be to what we are expecting or what we like it to be, Father, we still give you thanks. We still give you praise, O oh God, because you have the whole world in your hands. And Father, we are your children, we are your sons and your daughters, and we lean upon you, we depend upon you there, Father God. We cast all our cares upon you, Lord. As we prepare to study your words today, Lord, bless us with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, discernment, revelation. Make yourself known to us there, Father. Bless all those who are here today to listen to your words there, God. Holy Spirit, take full control of everything we ask of you. In Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. We are picking up from Exodus chapter 31. Last week we studied and we completed chapter 30 last week. And we saw where the Lord gave Moses instruction to um, make the different incense that he had to use to... to um, fumigate the tabernacle, the sanctuary, and all of those different areas. Also, there was a special anointed oil that he instructed him to make, give him the instruction how to make the oil, the purpose of the oil, what it was supposed to be used for, and what it was not supposed to be used for. And also there was a special perfume that the Lord uh, command Moses to make. And the person who was chosen to make that perfume, or persons who was chosen to make that perfume, they were not allowed to make it for their own personal use. It was a private, it was a sacred um, perfume, sacred oil, and it was only supposed to be used for the purpose that God designed it for. And you know, that is showing us that we cannot copycat the things of God. We cannot manufacture the things of God. We cannot substitute the things of God. When God desi designs something, it is for His use and it is for His purpose. Praise the Lord. So we pick up from uh, chapter 31 today and it said, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Here we see that God is speaking to Moses. We have to understand that Moses is still on Mount Sinai. He's still up on Mount Sinai receiving the instruction from the Lord. Uh, from about maybe eight chapters back, we remember when Moses went up to Mount Sinai and he was up there to receive instruction from the Lord. He's still up there. And because of the length of time that he spent up there, we will see in chapter 32 that the people... They said to themselves that Moses is dead because he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights and they, they thought that he died up in the mountain and they asked Aaron to make a calf of gold so that they can have something to worship. But Moses was still alive and he was up there talking to the Lord. So it said in verse 1 of 31, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Now this is literally, God is speaking to Moses just like how I am talking to you today. And that is how God was communicating to Moses. Moses didn't have, you know, like how we have the Bible today, and, you know, he's reading from the Bible, and he takes it as God speaking to him. 
It was God literally speaking to Moses as he was on Mount Sinai. Now, we discuss this a lot of times that in our time, because of the fact that we have the Bible, we have the Word of God, we may not be chosen to hear God's natural voice speaking to us as how he spoke to Moses. You know, I'm not going to rule it out because I don't want to put God in a box. But I don't think there's a lot of people today who can say that God speak to them in, with a natural voice, that they can hear him through their, their, their physical ears. You know, because we are living in a different time in which we have the Word of God, the Bible have been given to us, and the Bible is God's Word, it is God's breath. And when we read the Word of God, it is God who is speaking to us. The, the Word of God that we have here today, that we are reading and we are studying from, it is just as powerful, just as timely, just as up-to-date as what God was saying to Moses up on Mount Sinai. So, if God is going to speak to a person today, it may not be literally you hearing him by, from your ears, physical ear canal. If God is going to speak to us today, he's going to speak to us through his words. So, I think what this is saying to us, if we are not reading the Word of God, if we are not studying the Word of God, God will not speak to us. God can speak to us if we are not in tune with His Word, if we are not listening to His Word, if we are not studying the Word of God. So, I don't really think, it, you know, it's the best thing to just sit back and just wait and expect God to, to hear the voice of God from heaven. God speaking to you and you hear Him with your natural ears and you talk back to Him. This is not the way that the Lord designed to really speak to us in these last days. And this is not to say that um, God cannot speak to a person physically because we cannot box God in. We cannot put him in a box. We can't say, well, you know, he can't do this and he can't do that. You know, the only thing that God, there's a few things that God can do. God can sin. God can lie. He can change. You know, those are the, 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 some of the few things that the Lord cannot do. But if God chose to speak to somebody and for them to hear him, just like how I'm speaking to you today, he can do that. But what we are saying, this is not the main channel by which God speaks to people. The main channel by which God speaks to us today is through the word of God. So therefore, we must be reading and studying the word of God so that the Lord can speak to us. Praise God. Amen. That's the reason why Bible study and, you know, studying the Word of God, reading the Word of God is so important. It electrifies us. It gives us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. It puts us right in the presence of God. So Moses, the Lord, saying to him, See, I have called by name Bezeel, the son of Uri." the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Now the Lord is saying here, See, or behold, or look. We are in Exodus chapter 31. See, behold, look. God is calling Moses' attention. He's calling him attention. God is trying to get Moses' attention here. See, I have called by name Bezeel. Now, I kind of believe that Moses... After he received all of these different instructions from the Lord and all of these commands that he was supposed to perform, maybe he was, the thought probably was going through his mind that the burden or the responsibility is so heavy and he probably had us to do all of these things by himself. But the Lord is calling his attention here. He said, see, I have called by name Bel." Be Bezil, the son of Uri, the son of Ur of the tribe of Judah. God called this guy Bezil by name and he chose him to be the foreman or 
the second person in charge or the site or the project manager when the, the tabernacle was supposed to be constructed. This guy was supposed to be the person who was going to supervise the work, who was going to deal with all of the different design where the tabernacle and all of those um, different things that the Lord instruct Moses to, to make. This responsibility was placed upon him. But you know, there are some things that really um, excite me here. In what I, when I read uh, this verse and I see that the Lord know this guy by name. God called him by name. God called the man by name. And uh, this is telling me that the Lord is taking personal interest in all of us. Every one of us as children of God, God is taking personal interest in us. Now, God is not like a physical man. There's a lot of men today who have children and they don't even know their names. A lot of men have children and they don't even know the name of their, their sons or their daughters. But it, this is not the way how the Lord operates. God knows us by name. I remember when, um, you remember when Saul was on his way to Damascus to persecute the children of God in Acts chapter 9. When the Lord um, Jesus called to him and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for uh, thee to kick against the prick. The Bible tells us, tells us that there was a light from heaven that shined you know, on Saul and he was blinded. And the scripture tells us that the apostle um, Saul at the time, he went to, to Joppa. He went to Joppa and he went to stay with a man called Simon the tanner. And uh, the Bible tells us that the house address was on a street that is called Straight. <laughs> and the Lord um, um, called, um, ba uh, it was, um, was it Anias? Anias. The Lord called Anias and he said to Anias, I want you to go to this address to find Saul. He is down at Tarshish. And uh, he is living with, uh, he's in the house of Simon the Tanner, and he's on the street that is called Straight. And uh, when I read that and I look at this uh, verse here and see that the Lord is calling this man by name and giving Moses instruction in regards to this man, it really makes me understand that the Lord care about us. That's the reason why the Bible said every hair of our head is number. I know some of us don't really have hair. <laughs> but still, you know, when we was a kid, the Lord still know how much we had there. <laughs> every hair on our head is all number. God have, you know, the number of our hair. He knows everything that's going on in our life. The Bible said, his thoughts, our thoughts is not his thoughts. His thoughts is higher than our thoughts. His ways is higher than our ways. The scripture said he know our down sitting, he know our uprising. God know everything that is going to transpire in the life of every person upon the face of the earth. God is in total control. Especially over the lives of his children. He is in total control. So this guy, um, Basil, was uh, chosen by the Lord uh, to supervise the construction project and all of the different um, things, vessels that the Lord asked Moses to design. And uh, it said in the verse that he was the son of Uri, the son of uh, Hor. You know, if you notice here in the Bible, they didn't have any way or any word by which they can um, call, like how we can say, well, um, your grandson or your grandfather. You will not read the Bible and see where it talks about grandson and see where it talks about grandfather. You will hear, always hear, you say, well, this person is the son of this one and he is the son of that and keep on using the word son of that one and son of this one. You never hear you use, well, he's the grandfather of this one or the grandson of that person. Everybody is the son of this person and the son of that other person. Because in, in Bible time, they did not have those words whereby we have grandfather and grandson. So that's the reason why he, 
have uh, saying here that he is the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. So this guy, he was from the tribe of Judah. Praise the Lord. Verse 3. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. So here we see the Lord is saying here that he filled this guy, Bazil, with the Spirit of wisdom. Now, most places in the Old Testament, when the Bible, when the Lord talk about the Spirit of God, you will hear, he will mention and say, well, the Spirit of God comes upon an individual. The Spirit of God used to come on people. But most places, you're not going to find a lot of places in the Old Testament where he said that God filled a person with the Spirit of God. This, um, these words that is being used here, that the Lord filled with the Spirit of God, is more or less, it's a New Testament term. And here we see God is using this New Testament theology to deal with this guy. God is saying that the Spirit is not going to just come upon him. Remember that the Spirit used to come upon Saul. The Spirit used to come upon David. David and all of these guys, the Bible never said that they have the Spirit within them. The kings and the priests and all of these men, they were anointed from outside. But here, the Bible is saying that God said that this guy who is going to supervise the work, he is going to fill him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. We see first here it have wisdom. And there's a lot of you know, talk today about wisdom. What is wisdom? You know, you go on the internet and you put in the word wisdom. What is the definition of wisdom? You'll, you'll get all kinds of different um, sites that will, or people who will try to interpret what wisdom is. Anybody today know what is wisdom? Anybody know what is wisdom? What is the interpretation of wisdom? How does wisdom, how do you interp with, uh, interpret wisdom? Praise the Lord. Anybody have the interpretation of wisdom? Anybody know what wisdom is? You want, you want to go? You want to go by the mic? One. Now, if we go to categorize, I don't know if we're going to categorize in, the, in natural terms, okay? Like um, in a godly way. Yes. Ah, the godly way? Yes. Okay. I will put it, I will say it, okay, it's based on common sense. It's, it's, it's a common, it's, I will say common sense because today they have it as um, psychology. Where is, is, a, is a natural and is a natural endowment come from God, which which is based on your intellect, which is intelligence, mm -hmm. and somebody will use it. Okay, um, in, in the early days they, they call it um, they used to say call people that have these magicians, but the word magician come from the word um, magicos is come from the Greek word magicos, which we have which we have it in the um, in the time of Christ they call the three wise men come from um, Babylon, which they call magi's. Mm -hmm. So I believe it's a natural, ability, a natural ability to do things, which is a gift from God. Well, I, I agree with what you're saying, um, you know, because you, you use the word intellect. Intellect. Um, and uh, wisdom, Bible wisdom, wisdom that comes from God, is the ability to discern. Is the ability to discern good from evil, right from wrong. Also, it's not only the ability to know right from wrong, but it's the ability to put, wis uh, to put knowledge and understanding into operation. Wisdom is the ability. It's somebody who has the ability to put into practice, to demonstrate or to act out the things that they understand and the things that they know. So, Wisdom is an ability that God gives to an individual. That the knowledge that you have, the, wisdom, the understanding that you have, you can act it out. You can put it into operation. So it's the ability to discern. It's the ability to know right from wrong. You see, wisdom is not education. You know, sometimes you see a person is highly educated. 
Um, a lot of times a person can be highly educated, but they don't really have wisdom. Take, for instance, there's a lot of people today who went to, you know, the highest um, level of university. They graduate and they come up with different, you know, degrees and all of that. And still, they seems they're not able to get ahead in life. They have a lot of knowledge. They have a lot of understanding. They go through all of those university books. But they don't have the ability to put what they know and what they understand. It seems as though they don't have that ability to put it into operation. And there's a lot of people who never really go to that level of um, education in school. And they seem to have ability to put what they know and what they understand to put it into operation. And these people are advancing. So um, wisdom don't have anything to do with a person being educated or a person not being educated. It's an ability and it's something that comes from God. It's an anointing that comes from God. And we are so grateful that we, we are, you know, in a position that we can receive wisdom from God. So this guy, the Bible said that the Lord is going to fill him with the Spirit of God in wisdom. Meaning that he's going to have the ability... To understand. You see, you have the word understanding. And as Brother um, Elder Lewis was using the word the intellect. When you, when you um, study um, the definition of wisdom, you'll see the word intellect also will come up. Um, it has to do with intellect. Somebody who is, you know, wise in their mind. Somebody who is, whose um, understanding is enlightened. Somebody who can discern, who can separate good from evil, right from wrong. You know, there's a, there's a lot of educated people who, it seems as though they don't have the ability to know right from wrong. When you look at a lot of people today, who, their lives is so messed up. A lot of people who is up front, a lot of people who is in Hollywood, whose lives are so messed up. Is This morning I was coming in, by the way, and I was listening to the news and they said that Whitney Houston passed away. You know, she, she's a powerful, she was a powerful woman. And, but it seems like she didn't have any wisdom. Didn't have any, didn't have the ability, you know, to put um, wisdom into operation. What she know into operation. So, you see, wisdom is the ability to put into operation what you know or what you understand. It's no sense to know something or to understand something. You know, you accumulate a lot of knowledge and you can't put into operation what you know. Praise the Lord. Sometimes it's not easy to bring out what you know. <laughs> yes, yeah, go ahead, brother. What, what, what I do understand concerning um, this, this um, ab special ability that God gives you, um, the ability that is something that to be protected, because you receive all this um, information in your in your mind, mm. and you have it unprotected. Just as, as you just mentioned with Whitney Houston, she may have the ability to do a lot of things, but she was challenged by the whole society, and she 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 didn't have no guard in, guard in her life, I should say, mm -hmm. to protect the the, the, um, the type of skills that she have. Mm. So I believe when somebody receives this this special gift, you must have some kind of divine protection for this information. Because if you don't have it, I tell you what, Satan is going to destroy you. He's well, going to destroy you across the board. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, anything that is good, the enemy main aim is to destroy. You know, and he said that he will be filled with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge. So you see, uh, wisdom, understanding, and in knowledge. All of these things kind of run into each other. Um, you know, if you have wisdom, understanding and knowledge going to be there too. They, they're going to go together. Praise the Lord. You will be able to understand things. I think it was David who said that he had more understanding than even his teachers, those who were teaching him. <laughs> he was the pupil, the professor. Could you imagine you going to a, a, a school and you understand more than your professor? David was saying that. He had more understanding than those who were teaching and uh, those three goes together and in all manner of workmanship. So this guy 
he was a skillful person. He was a person who was already involved in, you know, these designs. And God chose him. Whatever he was doing before um, the Lord, you know, at this point, the guy don't really know that God chose him yet because Moses is still up on the mountain. But this guy was involved in that kind of work before. God didn't just choose him, you know, out of the blues. The Lord knew what he was doing. And the skills that he had, God was using those same skills that he can become a minister for him. And sometimes you hear people talk about becoming a minister for God. Whatever physical ability you have, whatever physical ability you have, that is where God is going to start to use you from. You know, sometimes we want God to start using us from we start performing miracles. But that's not where God is going to start from. Whatever ability you have, God is going to start right from there. For instance, you are a musician, guitar player, whatever. You are a good talker. You know, whatever physical skills you have. You are a trade man, trade uh, person. Whatever skills or ability you have is right there. God is going to start. Your ministry starts from right there. From where, whatever physical skills that you have, that's where your ministry starts. You know, ministry don't have to be, you know, preaching and teaching the word of God. Whatever you are involved in, God is going to use that. Is the Lord that said to Moses, when Moses was out there tending the sheep and the Lord called him and he went up to Sinai, he saw the burning bush and all of that and he was sent down to um, Egypt and he started to make up all of the different excuses why he couldn't go. And uh, the Lord asked him, he said, what do you have in your hand? <laughs> What do you have in your hand? He said, a rod. Because he had that rod for maybe 40 years. That was what he was using to defend himself, to guide the sheep and all of that. And the Lord um, used the rod that Moses had in his hand. Could you imagine that rod he had there for how many years becomes so important? That was the rod that caused all of the different, most of the, the, the miracles that the Lord um, caused to be shown to Pharaoh. Moses um, the rod have a lot to do with it. The parting of the Red Sea. But God used what Moses had in his hand. So a lot of times it's what we have right in our possession at present. God is going to start from. Yes. Talents and gifts. Well, um, you see, spiritual gift. Um, spiritual gift and talents. You know, is different. A spiritual gift is different than a talent. You have worldly people who have talents, but a talent doesn't have to be, it's a spiritual gift. Yeah, it, well, it's, it's given from God. Yes, it comes from God, but it's not a, a spiritual gift in the sense when we talk about the, the, the gifts of the Spirit and stuff like that. That cannot be equated with one of the gifts that we see in the Bible. It's a talent. It is something that is given to every person. Every person, every human person have talent. Every human person have talent. But when we talk about a gift, and we're talking about a gift that is from the Bible, from God, or in terms when we talk about the nine gifts of the Spirit, or, uh, because uh, according to what they, they're saying, there's a lot more than nine. The different gifts of the Spirit, they are not in the same bracket as somebody who have the skill to be a carpenter or somebody have the skill to play a guitar. That is a talent too and it's a gift. It comes from God because it's God who created that person. And if God didn't give that person the understanding, they would not have understand how to you know, um, play the guitar and how to perform whatever trade they probably are involved in. But it's not on the same scale as the gifts that comes from the spirit that we see in the word of God. But it is a talent. And it is a gift. And it was given to the person from the Lord. But it's not all, it's not all on the same level. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. I don't know if that helped, brother. Thank you, Lord. So, um, this guy, he was filled with wisdom and understanding and knowledge. And in all manner of workmanship. So, God is going to use us right where we are. Right, whatever you are involved in. God is going to use you right there. You know, you might be a trade person. 
you know, you're going out on different jobs and you're meeting with different people. That could be your ministry. God could use you by the way you carry yourself, the way you perform your work, the way you, the attitude that you have when you deal with the customer. You may not be a good talker, but the way how you deal with people, God just use you to, to, to let your light shine before people in the field that you are working in. Praise the Lord. Verse 4. To devise cunning work, to work in gold and in silver and in brass. So God is going to give this guy that special anointing so that he will able to devise or to design cunning work. Work that is hard to you know, craft, craft out, to figure out. He will have the ability to work these things out. Because you remember when we was dealing with the, um, the, the breastplate? The breastplate that the Lord um, said that Aaron was supposed to make. And uh, we deal with the Ark of the Covenant and the shoulder piece and all of those. Um, the ephod. And we deal with Aaron's garment. All of those things was very complicated where the design was concerned. And this is the guy that the Lord has chosen here. And he's placing all of this um, ability in him so that he can um, bring these things into um, operation. God is not going to come down from heaven and do it himself. He's got to put it through a man. He's got to do it through a man. And this is the guy that he chose. Um, verse 5. And in cutting of stones, I just mentioned the, the breastplate and the ephod. And remember those 12 stones that was on the ephod. They had us to cut because the ephod... The place where the stones were supposed to be placed, it, was, it had limited amount of space. And 12 stones representing um, the 12th tribe of Israel was to be placed on the breastplate of the ephod. And uh, the, the, the designer here, he had to be able to cut these stones so precise that it will fit in that space. Praise the Lord. To set them... And in um, carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. So this is a very skillful, talented individual. God is placing, you know, this anointing upon this person. And he will have all of the ability to design all of these things. You know, when God's anointing come upon an individual, it changed that person. Praise the Lord. When the anointing of God come upon an individual, even though you are not qualified to do certain things, when the anointing come, it makes you qualified. You know, I know a lot of people who didn't reach fine school, and when they stand up to minister, and the, the understanding that they have in regards to the Bible, the way how they can break down the Bible and explain it so that people could understand the intelligent, the, the, the educated guy, maybe those guys who even went to Bible college and they have their different degrees, different um, direction, they are not able to explain it in such a way as how the person who may not, you know, be so um, educated, able to do it. And it's all, it's, it's the anointing. That's why the Bible says it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. It is not by, 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 by works of righteousness which we have done, but by His mercy He saved us. It's the anointing that is going to do it. And this guy was anointed by God. He was anointed by, by, by the Lord with the Holy Spirit. And he had the ability to perform all of these different um, functions. Verse, verse 6. Is it verse 6? And I will, and I, behold, I have given with him a whole, a whole layer, the son of a Hishamash of the tribe of Dan, and in his heart all, and and in the heart of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded thee. So here we see that God is giving um, this guy, the designer, the chief, um, the project manager. God is giving him an assistant to work along with him. You know. Sometimes you find people who probably having difficulty becoming an assistant. You know, but when you look in the Bible, you see so many people who play second fiddle. 
And they did it to the honor and to the glory of God. Look at Joshua. Joshua was Moses' assistant for a long time. And he did it with honor. There is nothing disgraceful in playing second fiddle to, to somebody. You know, sometimes we think that if we are not um, the head of whatever we are doing, you know, we can't really um, put out what we're supposed to put out. But even though you may not be the head, and you may, you know, be an assistant, or you may not even be an assistant, but you have something to, some part to play in that thing. Do it to the best of your knowledge and ability. And here we see this guy was chosen to be the assistant. And I don't think that it was going over in his mind. Oh, you know, I should have been the one who was leading this thing, you know. You know, I, 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 don't, I can't really work under him. I should have been the one who leading. I think that he worked with him and he functioned in his role as assistant. And he did it to the best of his knowledge and ability. You know, um, where I work with the city, for the last two years, they have this guy who, um, they put him in a temporary position. I didn't even know it was a temporary position he had because the way how he was acting as if, well, you know, he's one of the city fathers. <laughs> he's a little guy, short like this. <laughs> it seems as though anytime little people, little short people, it seems as though power tends to go to their head. <laughs> I heard people say that. When you're short, it seems as though power tends to go to little people's head. <laughs> and I didn't know that he was doing this job temporary. <laughs> and... Um, he was the, 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 the supervisor or the chief, the head over, I think, about five of the city's um, service um, mechanic shop. And uh, in every mechanic shop, they have the person who's supposed to run that mechanic shop. So he decided that he's going to come in Ellesmere, where we work, and he set up his office in Ellesmere. And what he did, he, he could have got the next office. He moved out the, the guy who's supposed to supervise the shop in Ellesmere. He moved him out from that office and he put him outside to sit down on a little uh, desk. And he took over the big office. And you know, this white guy, I so admire this guy. Yes? I don't know if I might be able to do that. The guy sit down outside there for two years. And he allowed this guy, he's not supposed to run the shop. He's supposed to supervise for the shop. But he's not supposed to come and run one of the shop. He run that shop. He control. He say what to do. And this guy just sit down there and he do everything that he wants, ask him to do without even complain. And when the time come now for them to fill the position, you know, everybody thought that he's going to get the job because he's doing it for two years already. Lo and behold, they chose somebody that is below him. <laughs> and they just, you know, override him. And put him right back now to be an ordinary supervisor. So, you know, I really admire this um, city um, supervisor guy. He stayed there and he could have said, well, I'm supposed to be running this shop. And, you know, you're not supposed to tell me what to do because I'm in charge of the shop here. But, you know, he didn't do that. He just abide with him and he just do what he's supposed to do. And everything just work right out. Right now, he... He's preparing now to move into the office because they just, they just kick this guy out and then emote him. So, you know, sometimes we need to be patient. We need to be patient. So, you know, if God, you know, place you in a position and you may not be the chief cook and bottle washer, you know, you may be playing second fiddle, you know, it's good to play your role. Do what you have to do. You know, I know a lot of people, they find it difficult when they deal with these things, for instance, look in a home. You find in a home where the husband might be the leader of the home. And he might be the one that, you know, lead the, 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 the point man in making a lot of decisions. And sometimes you find some wives, they might figure that they, you know, they are playing a, a second fiddle kind of role. But, you know, even where the family is concerned, there's nothing wrong in uh, the, the, the wife um, playing second fiddle to the husband. There's nothing shameful about that. And it's, it's a role that a woman should take on and they should do it joyfully. And if you're doing that joyfully, God is going to bless you. 
But if you're doing it, you know, I only doing it because they say he's the head of the home, you know. But, you know, uh, I, I don't think, you know, I don't think it's right. I don't think it's right for me to be um, subject myself under him like that. You know, I don't think I can't stand it. But I'm only doing it just because I want to have peace. Do it, you know, to the honor and glory of God. And, you know, God is going to bless you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> who knows? Maybe that guy might die a bit young and you might be the one who might be um, moving up in the, the chief cook and bottle washer position. Praise the Lord. I see it a lot of times. A lot of times, you know, where guys, you know, they lead and then they, they build up whatever, build house, you know, accumulate funds and stuff like that. And then they passed away. And lo and behold, who, who is in charge? It's the woman. So whatever position you are in, do it joyfully. Praise the Lord. Don't complain about what you're doing. And God is going to take you to the top. Praise the Lord. We are going to close here. Anybody have any um, comment or any question that you'd like to ask before we close? I would love to say, um, in the home, the, the lady is in charge. But there is a portion in the Bible that says the man is the head of the home. No, no, I, I didn't say I didn't say the lady in charge. <laughs> and that's all that you want to say. That's no, sorry, no. I, I said, um, uh, well, everybody who know me will know <laughs> that I I firmly believe that the husband is the head of the home. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that sometimes the lady they they, they will find it kind of hard thinking that they are playing that second fiddle role to the husband because most of the time. You know, at least, uh, you know, the husband should be the point man. The man who is leading the family, even though he don't have all of the bright ideas. Because most time, we as men, we don't have all the bright ideas. Yeah, we, sometimes we fail to take the position we're supposed to take. Yes. The, lady, the ladies step up sometimes, and they play the role. And most times, the men come and get harassed us because of the failure of us. The but, ladies but, have to play our role sometimes. Right. Well, I, I think well, that is good. Yes, I, I agree that. There, there are some men who just relax and just cool and just, you know, oh, I let, let my, wife, my wife handle that and stuff like that. But um, in reality, we as men, you know, we're supposed to lead the home. Not just to beat our chest and say, well, I am in charge and I am the boss and I say this and I have to have it my way. That's not what he's talking about. Lead. <laughs> Amen. It means that when you are the leader... You should be uh, the leader of the home. He should be the chief servant. Anybody, uh, Jesus said, anybody who wants to be the head or the chief leader, you have to be the chief servant. You know, when anything to be done in the home, you as the leader, you as the one who's supposed to set the example. It's the same thing, I'm the pastor of this church. Anything to be done here, I shouldn't say, well, I'm the pastor and I don't think I should be able to, I have to go and do that. I should be the one who... Taking the, the, the lead role, if it's the garbage to take out, you know, I should be the one. That, that, that shouldn't be above me that I was, should say, well, I can't do that and I can't do this. We have to set the example. So, um, as the brother was saying, yes, we believe that the, the man, he's supposed to lead the home. But in, in a lot of cases where we are reluctant to um, weigh the pants, so to speak, the woman... She is going to do it. <laughs> Amen. Because somebody got somebody to gotta, um, rule. Somebody got to get things going. But it's the man's responsibility to lead. And he was talking about sometimes men will get harassed, he say, when the woman take the leading position. You see, the thing is, ladies, in the home, even though you are the one who have the bright idea, even though you are the one that have the knowledge and the talent to figure things out, you should not make it known to the rest of the world that all of the bright ideas coming from you. That is, that is, what is, that is where, see, men does get the problem from. When the bright idea comes from the woman and she's making it known to everybody, it's me who do that, you know. It's, it's I who think out that and it's I who make that decision. Even though it is you who have the bright idea, what you have to do, you have to give the credit to your husband. I know it may not sound good in the eyes of the world, but according to um, Bible um, leadership, even though you, you is the one who have the bright idea, always say, my husband and I think that, or my husband think this. Praise the Lord. And you do this, God is going to bless you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.
I know, it, you know, these things to the world, it sounds like um, it's male chauvinist thing that going on and it's just Pastor Duncan who just want to be in charge of everything and he want to run the show and, and all of that. But if you do that, if you place yourself under subjection to your husband and you surrender yourself to him and he take that responsibility to lead, you will see how God is going to bless that home. God is going to bless your relationship. Well, nothing wrong with that, you see, but because, you know, uh, we, I know you're talking about devotion, but even with other things too, um, it, is, it is the husband's um, responsibility to delegate. You're supposed to delegate. Uh, you know, I, I, I as a father and I as a husband, I can't do everything. Yes, you have to. You know, you can't do everything. Although, you know, there are some things, there are some things, I know it probably may not go over well, but there are some things in my home, I'd rather do it myself because, you know, I'm a person, the way I operate, if I tell you to do something, for instance, if I say to my wife, um, this thing is very important, I want you to do it tomorrow. You have the time to do it, go and do it tomorrow. I don't want to come home and I say you do that thing, and then she knock her head. Oh, you know, I forget. I can't handle that. If something is important, anytime you see something is important to me, I can't forget it. I make it my duty to go out and do it. So before I give it to she, for she to say she forget it, and then when I come home, expect it to be done, and then you're going to cause confusion, i rather go and take my time and do it myself and make sure that it's done. Praise the Lord. That's how I operate. So there are some things that I know I want it done, and I don't want no excuse about it. I go in all to do it. But you have to, you ha- you have to delegate. Delegate responsibility to them. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless us. Praise God. Um, Sister Lewis, ask God blessing as we close.